Okay. So um, I just wanted to warmly welcome all of you uh, for this uh, second session of the joint ISC TIFR webinar series in chemical sciences. I am Jyotishman Dasgupta, and um, I, along with Professor Satish Patel at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, um, welcome all of you um, through um, through the through the uh, online. Zoom platform, as well as the YouTube live link that all of you have joined um, today. Uh, so uh, we will continue with our um, uh, talk by Professor Frank Spano. Uh, Frank, thanks for joining again. Good morning to you as well. Good morning. Um, and uh, we would like to first um, start by giving a again a little bit of a intro as to why we started the series um, and. Uh, the idea that uh, we discussed, both Satish and I, um, that uh, because of all the, uh, the the vast literature that we are surrounded with in this current times, where you know practicing practicing scientists, both uh, independent PIs like us, as well as students and postdocs, find it hard to you know figure out what are the conceptual basis for uh, different ideas that prevail in the literature. And um, it's sometimes very important to get back to uh, the fundamentals, the basics of uh, how a particular topic or particular field developed in science and especially in chemistry where um, you know, it's an experimentally heavy science and um, you have to ultimately work in the lab and produce a deliverable, right? And for that, you should be armed with all the knowledge that you have so that your creativity gets a chance to come out in your work. So uh, with this kind of an idea, we thought we should actually ask the experts in the community. And because Zoom and other online platforms are so nice nowadays, you can actually invite uh, the world leaders right at um, to us, you know, in our institutes in India. And uh, Frank started this series yesterday wonderfully well. Um, and I'm glad that uh, uh, he agreed and Although it's a very early morning, time zones change. It's slightly, um, a, and also a different political climate at this point <laughs> in this country. Still, uh, with all those tension in mind, he, 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 uh, he is so happy to give this, uh, this set of two talks, two tutorial style talks. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, uh, ask Satish to briefly give a little bit of a, um, uh, you know, kudos to ACS. Okay. So thank you, Jedi. Uh, I think the idea behind this webinar already Jedi explained. Uh, with this idea, we approach to uh, both the institute. I think I must thank the TIFR and ISC, uh, especially a department chair in our uh, department here in Ananda Bhattacharya, uh, I, as well as uh, the leadership in a TIFR. They immediately came forward and they immensely supported this idea. You know. Uh, along with the similar idea, we also approached to ACS and they were very, very happy uh, with their popular science talks. They came forward. Uh, thanks to Diksha, thanks to Ajay uh, for sponsoring this event. So back to JD. Yeah. Thank you, Satish. And um, again, it's, uh, it's an honor to uh, sort of formally introduce Professor Spano. And uh, I will slightly uh, do it uh, based on what my uh, personal associations or you know, feelings are towards him. Uh, but let me just uh, first um, give his brief educational background. He did his uh, bachelor's in physics from Lehi University, uh, where he graduated in 1982, post which he joined uh, Princeton University and Professor Warren Warren's group. Um, and as Frank was telling us, he was one of the first, very first students in Warren's lab, where he did both experimental and computational optical spectroscopy, and uh, especially coherent transient spectroscopy. That's what uh, that's what uh, Warren was developing at that time. Um, and um, uh, after finishing his work with uh, Pro uh, Professor Warren Warren, uh, he moved on to Another giant in the community of uh, coherent multidimensional spectroscopy, Professor Shaul Mukamil, uh, in University of Rochester at that time, 
Um, and um, uh, he did some uh, fascinating work uh, with nonlinear spectroscopy and uh, different kinds of multidimensional spectroscopy. Um, and after his tenure at uh, Rochester, he moved to Temple where he has been ever since. Um, but what, what I find fascinating about um, Professor Spano's work over time, he's really focused his work uh, on uh, molecular aggregates at that time when people uh, were not uh, sort of thinking much about it. But with his work and with the advent of contemporary thinking that we can make molecule-based devices, uh, going from a solution phase to film phase, it has become almost impossible to not advocate our understanding of excitations in you know, aggregated systems. And that's where it, it's really become important uh, uh, where Professor Spano's contribution to the literature um, of understanding, you know, excitons in aggregated systems, charge transfer in aggregated systems, as well as now he's looking into new kinds of ways of coupling excitations to cavities and other kinds of, uh, you know, other kinds of very interesting device architectures, uh, which one can harness uh, through uh, molecules, okay? So uh, with that, I would like uh, Professor Spano to give his second talk, Understanding Molecular Aggregate Photophysics, Part 2, um, Intermolecular Charge in intermolecular charge Transfer and HJ Aggregates. Professor Spano. Wow, thank you for that uh, very nice introduction, uh, JD and Satish. Thank you again. Uh, I, as I said yesterday, incredible honor to be at such a prestigious uh, you know, by, with such a prestigious invitation to this uh, incredible series of, of talks. So, um, wow, what an honor to start the whole thing off. But um, okay, so we're here on the on the second day, and um, I'm kind of going to pick up from where I left off yesterday. But I will review a little bit. That's uh, necessary to uh, understand our second uh, installment here, which is going to focus on intermolecular charge transfer. So yesterday we pretty much. Uh, stayed with the conventional Kasha model with respect to the electronic coupling, which is coulombic, right? Uh, dipole dipole. And, um, uh, we did add vibronic coupling, which was new, and looked and, and uncovered some uh, interesting uh, vibronic signatures. But today I'm going to look at a, a, another extension, which is in the direction of um, uh, charge transfer. So it's not all about dipole dipole coupling. Uh, in the end, if you have a pi stack, for example, with very close contacts between nearest neighbors, you really have to worry about the uh, wave function overlap. So today's uh, second talk will deal with the uh, will we'll deal with intermolecular charge transfer, and how does that impact the photophysical properties? And how does even more importantly, how does it uh, allow us to think about um, optimization, engineering, designing for particular applications? Like yesterday, we talked about OLEDs and OPV, you know, solar cells and things. Um, and so this, I, I feel, is just kind of the beginning because there's, I can just see so much more work to be done, uh, hopefully by, by others to pick up from, uh, from, from this uh, idea here, but we'll, we'll see. So um, this is almost the exact slide I left off with yesterday. And I uh, pose kind of the intriguing idea that, um, you know, what if you had J and H interactions coexisting within one aggregate, okay? So basically there's a competition, right? So I use this Jekyll Hyde, JH, you know, uh, metaphor to uh, kind of um, emphasize this kind of competition between uh, J and H promoting influences, right? And the simplest example of this is shown on the left there. And this is just a coulombically coupled aggregate, no, nothing more than that. So it's still within the regime of, of the Kasha model. And you can see that there's head to tail coupling along the long axis, which is J type, which is negative. Um, and uh, if you look side by side, of course, you have um, uh, a H like promoting you know, positive forces, J inter. And this is all dictated, very simply understood based on you know, uh, aligning you know, dipole side by side or head to tail. So you have these two different influences, and you can ask, you know, what kind of you know, new photophysics emerges, who wins, what, how do you monitor the competition? Are there signatures that will allow, allow you to tell who is actually, in, in, you know, what is actually happening? And so before I launch into this, uh, in, into the uh, extended theory, I want to generalize 
the uh, types of uh, HJ aggregates, and that's what I call them, by the way, obviously for, for good reason, right? Um, and the one on the left is the one I just introduced, and, but I'm gonna further define it to be a segregated HJ aggregate, because if you look at the competition that I discussed already, between the J promoting intrachain interactions and the H promoting interchain interactions, they're happening between different sets of chromophores, right? Side by side chromophores give you the H influence, head to tail give you the J. So they're different coupling. So I call those segregated HJ. And yesterday I alluded to the lutein uh, intra layer interactions as being uh, of this type. And you know I won't say too much about it today, but, it, but it's a very interesting uh, cancellation that could could occur or destructive interference um, in, in in such aggregates. But what I also want to introduce, and what I'm really going to focus on today, is another kind of HJ aggregate, which I call integrated HJ, because the competition is direct. In other words, between the same set of chromophores, like I have indicated here. But if you try to understand this columbically, you would say, you know, what are you, an idiot? There's only one interaction between two molecules. What's going on here? Well, I could further uh, if I look closely at the types of interactions, for example, in these pie stacks, I could identify two major contributions. I could give the old fashioned Coulomb coupling that Kasha would have liked. Um, but also, as I said earlier, there's wave function overlap between nearest neighbors. And I'll show you that that leads to a CT charge transfer mediated coupling. And then the interference between H and J happens between those two different distinct types of couplings, Coulombic, which is long range, and wave function or CT mediated coupling, which is short range. And they can also oppose each other and give you HJ aggregates, you see? And so those are the ones that I think are more uh, interesting for um, engineering purposes and also for uh, applications that we've we already, you know, I'll show you. There is a uh, question, so Frank, sorry, Jayashree sure. raised the hand. Uh, yeah. Jayashree, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, hello, Professor, uh, this is Jayashree. So um, so just a quick question as a two, these two categories, do they uh, preclude each other? Presumably you can have JCT along with the other J. Yes, yes, right? yes. You're in, you guys, you, I must say the questions you guys <laughs> ask, excellent. Yeah, I mean, this is just, as I said, the beginning, right? Because you can easily uh, introduce uh, J, you know, uh, CT mediated couplings, for example, in this uh, two dimensional aggregate and you can get lots of different varieties. Right. It's very, okay. very rich. Okay. In fact, yeah. Since you mentioned it, um, one of the uh, main applications that is kind of this, in, this uh, hybrid, if you want to call it, is if this was a polymer and then mm. these chromophores would be repeat units and then this would be a, uh, mainly a CT mediated, right? And then this right. would be, and then the side by side are mainly through mm -hmm. space coulombic. So that's yeah. what we also call an HJ. So that's why I said earlier, there's so much richness and so much opportunity for modification, design, engineering, that it's, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot to do, a lot yeah. to do. Okay, <laughs> okay. so uh, yeah, so, oh, before I go, uh, some of you may also wonder, well, why is he talking about destructive interference? He must be a very, uh, you know, negative guy to be focusing on that. But no, it's, you could, you could have HH and JJ where you have a constructive interference. This is, it expands these, the range of applications. So I'm going to focus today on this uh, PAT, which is tetraaza Um, I did a lot of work with Mike Barnes at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and he uh, measured photophysical properties of these pillars grown on graphitic surface, so they grow outward. And uh, they're basically pie, really efficient, well-ordered pie stacks. And, and that's the, the main morphology that I'm going to consider in today's talks for obvious reasons, right, because it has a nice pie overlap. And if you look at the uh, solution spectra of this, of this molecule, this TAT molecule, here's a clearer structure of it. You see you have your well structured. remember yesterday, the beautiful vibronic uh, absorption spectrum and emission spectrum, almost textbook, you know, uh, mirror, uh, mirror image symmetry. Um, and then when you construct these pillars, literally, um, you see a, a very, very uh, dramatic change in both of those observables. We're gonna focus almost entirely on the absorption spectrum because it's very interesting, right? Because you see a strong red shift and you see a strong blue shift. It's almost like expanding in both directions. And uh, you might kind of get a sense for H and J if you just kind of appreciate that, but we're gonna quantify it much greater. 
And this is a uh, interest. Uh, this is a, a, a recent study that we made with uh, Li Bai Huang at uh, uh, Purdue University, and I just don't have enough time to really get into it. But um, these are perline based. Perline based. Yeah. Excuse me. At Purdue. She's at yeah, Purdue. Yeah, at Purdue University. Yes. Um, and uh, she synthesized. Well, she uh, studied the uh, properties of these uh, molecules that you see here: PDI, perylene dienides, not terylene. Um, but they're in the class of these rylenes, and these rylenes behave very similarly. Um, and again, you see this uh, dramatic change between a solution spectrum, again beautiful vibronic structure, and then this gigantic, you know, broadening in both directions, red and blue in the crystal phase. And these are also very nice uh, pie stacks that you see in these cartoons on the bottom. Um, so uh, the point of this is to show that despite the fact that they're pie stacks, there are different types of pie stacks. These are kind of transverse oriented and these are kind of longitudinally oriented and they look kind of similar in the absorption spectrum. But if you want to read this paper by uh, on the bottom here by um, uh, April Olison, first author, um, you'll find that the PL properties and are, are very, very different. And we can ascribe these to really efficient HJ aggregates, but um, on different sides of the null point, if you want. All right, so what I'm gonna talk about today, first, I gotta review a little bit from yesterday. So, um, you know, and I'll do it quickly because obviously we did uh, spend more time yesterday um, and then get right to the important point, which is electronic coupling. Uh, and dividing it between long and short range, and then talking about interferences between those two. And then the types of aggregates, which we already introduced, H, J, and also a new type, which is called, I call null aggregates, where you have a very efficient destructive interference. Um, and then uh, a detailed look at this molecule I introduced and then summarize. So uh, review now, this is uh, Frank Lakasha theory, and it's predicated, as I said yesterday, and on Coulomb coupling, which is often called through space. It's also often called long range because it's one over our cube. So you can have interactions between fairly well-spaced molecules. Um, the uh, simplest way to understand it is point dipole dipole, which you see here the formula for. Um, and this gives rise, the side by side gives rise to a positive and therefore H aggregates and the head to tail. If you look at this expression, it will, be, you know, it will give you a negative value and of course a J aggregate. So uh, we also talked about, you know, uh, linear aggregates of, of J, uh, linear J and H aggregates. And uh, we introduced the basis set, showed that um, a simple Frankel exciton Hamiltonian um, gave, gave rise to these so-called Frankel excitons, which are just delocalized wave functions, right? Uh, with phase factors. And we, we, we showed how only the K equals zero state absorbs and the other K states that are not zero uh, have destructive interference in their dipole moments, transition dipole moments, that is, and they don't absorb. Um, and uh, this is already, as I said, sufficient for, this is basically where Kasha left off, okay? Um, and uh, if you want to, I didn't show this yesterday, but I, I'm going to show this uh, form of exciton dispersion. We showed like a particle in a box type uh, diagram yesterday, but it could also be summarized in a graph which shows the exciton energy right, as a function of the K vector. And what I see here is this big frown. I want you to remember frown because H aggregates, remember Mr. Hyde, bad, bad man, right? So big frown, and what does that frown mean? When K is zero, the optical allowed state, the one that has all the oscillator is on top of the band, you see? And as you go away, the uh, bottom of, towards the bottom of the band, you hit the K equal pi state, and that's the one that has all the nodes in it, and therefore it's very inefficient at emission. But if you change the sign, of course, you get a J aggregate and that's a big smile, okay? And that means the K equals zero state sits at the bottom of the band, right? And it's very easy to then associate that with the, the philanthropist, Dr. Jekyll, the J aggregate, right? So I want you to think JH, smile, frown. Um, and uh, it helps to uh, what I'm gonna show in the, in, the, in the following slides. Okay, so that's a summary. And of course, the bandwidth is given by the uh, distance or the width of, uh, of, of you know, K equal pi minus the K equal zero exciton, and it's four times the nearest neighbor coupling. We also talked about emission where J aggregates, uh, since the absorbing state is the band bottom state, they're very efficient radiative emitters and even super radiant, whereas H aggregates are very inefficient uh, emitters because the band bottom state, again, has all those nodes in it and has 
ideally no oscillator spray. So we also introduced now, this is still Kasha, right? And so yesterday we talked about introducing uh, vibronic coupling and very quickly, we then assumed each chromophore uh, was not just a ground and excited state, but also uh, couple, each of those states coupling to a particular mode, in this case, the vinyl stretching or the quinoidal aromatic mode, which is prominent, which is responsible for those progressions you see in those spectra. And again, when you excite directly, you have uh, some nuclear relaxation energy, which when you uh, normalize it to a vibrational quantum, gives it the HR factor, right? We talked about the HR factor um, dictating the relative intensities to the frank condon factor. So we talked about lambda squared equal one, giving you equal intensities of the absorption spectra and also in the emission spectra. And those are good starting points for theory because when they're equal intensity, it's much easier to catch changes in it due to things like intermolecular coupling. So we, we introduced this for, the, for each chromophore and then we allowed them to couple electronically like we saw with like Akasha. And we uh, then uh, have a new Hamiltonian to describe the system, which, was, which we call the frankel holstein um, and it has vibrational energy and electronic coupling and vibronic coupling. Um, we show that now from this Hamiltonian, you not only get the Kasha spectral shifts for J and H, you also get vibronic signatures. So in one slide now, let me just remind you of these vibronic signatures. If you have a single molecule, again, with the huang Reese factor set to one, so that both absorption and emission has equal uh, intensities for the first two vibronic peaks, and then you look at J or H by controlling or changing the sign of the coupling. So here the coupling between say nearest neighbors is negative, here it's positive. And you see the changes in the spectrum are dramatically different. The uh, absorption ratio uh, increases in a J aggregate and we call it A00 over A10. And we gave a perturbative expression for that yesterday. Um, whereas in the H aggregate, it decreases, you see? So everything is opposites. It's always opposites with J and H, just like the real Jekyll and Hyde. It's complete opposite. So if you know one, you know the other, right? I always say you only need to store half the information because the other is just so obviously just the opposite, right? So your brain can, can assimilate this not so in, a, in an easy way. Um, and if you look at emission, um, you see that there is no uh, zero, zero emission in an H aggregate, again, because the emitting state has all those nodes in it. Um, and whereas the J aggregate has an enormous zero zero emission, this is the coherent super radiant peak. And we talked about how the ratio gives you the coherence number and so on. So that kind of very quickly summarizes uh, the vibronic signatures that we went into in detail yesterday. But we're gonna need them to continue our, our uh, journey into these additional types of aggregates, right? Because we- Can I quickly it. ask a question here, quickly? Sure. Yeah, so, so here, all of this is uh, essentially your uh, simulation of the absorption with vibronics, right? So yes. in this case, uh, you use a single mode, a single, yes. um, uh, some CC stretch, I think. And mm -hmm. um, uh, if you were to start using multi-modes, multi-mode effects, Mm -hmm. uh, will that change? Will that have a, a problem? Like you're dominated by a single mode, which is largely okay. displaced. Another, it, it, a continued series of very good questions. Yeah. So um, in reality, if you look at the uh, a spectrum of, you know, uh, a, a, a high res spectrum of um, perylene or any of these chromophores, there's really a cluster of modes around 1400 wave numbers. It's rarely just one. So, uh, one way to answer your question is you can kind of include uh, the cluster of modes by simply adding up their relaxation energies and in, into a single effective mode. And if the energies are close so that the broadening, which you see here uh, for each band is nor is greater and the broadening can be due to, you know, thermal fluctuations, whatever, you won't resolve them. You can, you can very uh, neatly consider a single effective mode. Okay, now if you have widely different energies, like a very slow mode, we talked about that a little bit yesterday too, uh, they will impact it very differently and you have to worry. But if it's a very low energy mode, you can, as we said yesterday, you can consider it in a kind of a static approximation where it can be accounted for as just like in homogeneous broadening. So um, if they're very similar to the mode in question, we use an effective mode. If they're very different, let's say in a, on the lower energy side, we can use a static approximation. Um, but you can think of, of situations where neither of those two extremes applies and then it could get a little hairy. Um, but luckily, uh, the systems that we've been uh, 
you know, um, focusing on do kind of uh, it, adhere to that kind of division where you have a cluster of modes roughly around 1400. And then of course, torsional modes and low vibrational modes, low frequency modes are always around, but they're very different in energy. Right, and there's one, there's one question by Jayashree. Um, uh, Jayashree, could you just uh, enumerate that question? Um, yes, Professor. Uh, so uh, I just wondered, you know, you had the HR factor which depended on the omega vibe, uh, which is just the frequency uh, used for that one mode and both for both the potential wells. Um, so how do you sort of extend this idea for two sets of uh, omega vibe? You know, potentially the excited state could have a shallower well and uh, you could have effects due to that. And so you're yes. saying um, different frequency wells or exactly. two different wells? Exactly. Uh, just two yeah. different frequencies for the two states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, this uh, similar question came up yesterday. You could do it. The in, the overlap factors um, that we use have a nice analytical form. I okay. didn't show it, but um, if you were to change the curvature of the upper versus the lower, um, again, if, if you don't change it too much, you're not going to get a very you know big deviation from what we have. But of course, if you dramatically make it shallow, like you're saying. Um, so that the frequency goes way down in the nuclear well, then it's going to have a, you know, we have not investigated that, to be honest. I All I can say is that we have, mm -hmm. the model can account for it uh, mm -hmm. without too much trouble. Um, by that, I mean, you can run programs with roughly the same basis set size and get good results. We'd have to evaluate the integrals, the overlap factors in a very, you know, we'd have to. Yeah, it's just the interpretation I was wondering about. Because it would be an interesting is a project. very powerful interpretation in terms of the shifts, right? So... Um, yeah, it would, it would, yeah, it would, it would be interesting to, to pursue that. Yeah. Okay. okay. But yeah, you, you would get, you know, it would, it would change things if it was right. dramatically different frequency. Okay. okay. You ready? Ready to, to go on? So buckle up and let's uh, enjoy the ride here. Okay. Can vibronic signatures monitor? This is the really, really fun thing, right? Um, can you really look at this competition, but monitor it um, by by other vibronic signatures, right? By, by, by similar ones, can you tell who's winning, J or H? And that's kind of fun, right? So let's now get into this um, details of the, in, of the actual coupling, electronic coupling. And so, as I mentioned, you have these pi stacks, right? Pi stacks are pi stacks because nearest neighbors are like, you know, close, like 0.35 nanometers, which is three angstroms or so. So they're really close. And of course their HOMO and LUMO orbitals will overlap. You can't you know, you can't get around that. And that will encourage charge transfer, right? So based on these overlaps, you can define a electronic trans uh, CT or charge transfer integral and a whole charge transfer integral, all right? So they very, they basically are equal to the um, Hamiltonian matrix elements between neighboring LUMOs for the electronic state and between neighboring HOMOs uh, for the, for the um, whole state, whole transfer. And so you have these, they're non-zero. So uh, uh, electrons can move, holes can move, and you can have conductivity. But what does that have to do with excitons, right? Can intermolecular charge transfer also drive energy transfer? And why is that important? Because if it can, is there a effect on the excitonic coupling? And that's what we're after here, right? We, we have neutral systems, um, but the exciton can dissociate to form these charges by having these overlap integrals be substantial. So, but let's just see if we can, how to understand it, right? So I have this little picture here, which I think is uh, very uh, helpful. Um, it's a little two-step, okay? So whereas before the Kulama coupling resulted in a direct transfer between a, between, this is a dimer, right? So you have the left molecule excited, that's what the little star means. And Coulomb coupling would take this and directly go to the excitation on the right. So it would move the coupling or the excitation one unit to the right. But if you look at this CT medi mediated coupling through these electron and hole transfer integrals, it's a two-step process, like a little dance, right? And so look at the first step, we have a TE, which we could say is, is substantial enough to allow the electron to move from the LUMO on the left to the LUMO on the right, resulting in this charge transfer complex, okay? Um, which will have a different energy. We're assuming here in this simple picture, it's, it's higher in energy. And then following that, you can move a hole. Now a hole moving to the right is an electron in the HOMO orbital moving to the left, right? Holes are like opposite of electrons. 
And so if you move a hole to the right, you then have established an overall excitation transfer from the left molecule to the right molecule. So move the hole to the right, you now result in this configuration where now the right is excited. So it's a two-step process, which is equivalent to an excitonic-like coupling, right? Because you can affect energy transfer through a double charge transfer, if you want to say it that way. And you can look at this, um, if this energy separation is large enough, the easiest way to see this is using perturbation theory. Um, and if you calculate this two-step process perturbatively, you'll find that the effective coupling, which I call JCT, is dependent on the product of TE and TH, no surprise, because it's two-step, and uh, also the difference in energy between the uh, CT state and the original, let's say, Frankel state. This is a perturbative expression, and it's called super exchange. It goes back to papers by Scholes, uh, Harcourt and Scholes. So this is not a new concept uh, at all, um, but it's, um, Competition with Coulomb coupling is, is new. And, but before we get to the competition, let's see uh, what the implications are for this new kind of, of excitonic coupling. Well, just like before, it has, uh, just like with Coulomb coupling, you can envision a positive and negative sign for JCT. Why not? Um, if you look at this, you could say, well, if the electron and hole have the same the transfer intervals have exactly the same sign, I call that the in phase, right? Then this overall sign will be negative and it does it behave like a J aggregate? Well, it has a negative coupling. Now, if T and TH are out of phase so that this product is negative, then this effective excitonic coupling will be positive. Does it act like an H aggregate? And so this is, this is uh, the motivation for trying to understand now what Vibronic signatures might reveal the presence of this coupling. Okay, so um, I have to show you this because this is really what we do. Uh, I don't want to go into detail, but I just want to point out that um, last lecture or, or even the beginning of this one, I showed you the Frankel Holstein Hamiltonian. Here it's, I wrote it a little bit differently in terms of raising and lowering operators, but it's the same Hamiltonian. This is where we left the, this is what we focused on entirely yesterday. Now I'm saying if I allow for that electron and hole, uh, to move, or you know, in other words, if I allow, allow for wave function overlap, then I have to add this whole second, this red Hamiltonian, and that allows for electron transfer. These are just raising and lowering operators. I won't go into detail. A uh, hole transfer, that's easy to envision based on that diagram. You can keep moving the hole to the right or, or to the left, whichever way you want. Um, you can envision that the CT state itself has a different energy, we call it ECT, and then you still have vibronic coupling. But the vibronic coupling now is on the cations and anions, and they can have different Juan Rees factors, you see? Lambda plus and lambda minus. And so it gets really complex numerically, but I just want to point out one thing. And the one thing that I, I, I want to emphasize is that, of course, you always can envision a, the Frankel exciton basis, but now you have, with this Hamiltonian, you have to expand the basis to include what we call charge transfer excitons, right? Where you have, in this case, a nearest neighbor separation between an electron and hole. So what has happened is a Frankel exciton, let's say on the nth site, has dissociated, right, um, into a charge separated state via these electron or hole transfer intervals to give you these CT, and they're coupled, right? But you can still define K states for CT exitons and K states for Frankel. And by symmetry, only light K states will interact. So K equals zero Frankel interacts with K equals zero CT. K equals pi Frankel interacts with K equals pi CT and so on. And the interaction matrix element is very, very, very important here is this quantity here. Okay, TE plus THE to the IK. Now I wanna point out something very interesting. If K is zero, remember K equals zero are the optically allowed states. This is just the flat out sum of TE and TH, right? If K is pi, then this is the difference of T, E, and TH. Just kind of remember that for what we're going to uh, introduce next. Now, um, again, I just want to show you what we do computationally. How do we, how do, we do this, right? Um, we have to have a basis set. And yesterday, we talked about the one particle basis of Frankel excitons. That's what the F means. We talked about two particle uh, Frankel states where you have a vibronic excitation and a vibrational excitation. Here it is over here. Um, I didn't write these down specifically, but you can easily imagine three particle states where you have a vibronic excitation 
and two other molecules which are vibrationally excited. Here's one in the 0, 1, 2, 3 state, and here's the 1 state. But when you expand your Hamiltonian to include charge transfer, you have to also treat anions and cations, right? So this is a, a um, excitation on the cation. And this potential shift here, as I said earlier, that can be different from the shift here. The lambda square, the huang Reese factor, which dictates the shift of the excited state potential, is normally smaller for a cation than for a neutral, and normally smaller for an anion than a neutral. Um, of course, you'd have to measure those with, you know, um, ultra um, violet photoelectron spectra or whatever, but um, they can are generally different. But the idea of multiparticle states is transfers beautifully from Frankel to CT states. And we can imagine, for example, as I show here, a CT state where the cation has two vibrational quanta and the anion has no vibrational quanta, right? And then I could go on, look how rich this is. I can get a, a, a CT state again, plus and minus with so many quanta associated with each. And then over here, I can have a, uh, or over here, sorry, I can have a vibrational excitation. So they're all together. All these are together, vibrational, electronic, anionic, cationic, and it's, you know, you set the basis set up. It might be complicated because there's many, many lines, but the idea is very straightforward. And you can couple all these together um, via the Hamiltonian and set up the matrix on your computer and do all these calculations. It's not that terrible in the end. But um, I won't bore you with that part of the, of the story, but um, I will tell you how to envision, how to appreciate the essentials of this effect. And I'm showing here two diagrams. And the idea here is very kind of cool um, because what I'm, uh, what I'm suggesting is that to get an H and a J aggregate, you don't even need Coulomb coupling. This is almost sacrilege, right? I don't know, Kasha would, if he was alive, might be very upset with me, right? You don't even need Coulomb coupling. I can get J and H aggregates in a completely different way. And let me show you how to think about it. Remember I said how to, fo you had to focus on that coupling between those, uh, the, the various excitons with the same wave vector. K is the wave vector. Now what I'm showing here is a, as a function of the K wave vector. So this goes from zero and it's in, divided by pi. So it's zero to pi. So this is a brilliant zone, right? Now what I show is a series of arrows. And if it's really dark red, that means the coupling between those K excitons, in, in this case, K is zero. That's really strong. It's like, like fire hot, right? very thick red. We're on the on the edges, these k equal pi states, which have all the nodes, it's, it's, it's zero. So I, I show no coloring. And if you look at this expression, let's try to understand it. We're going to, we're picking a, we're going to show that we can get a j aggregate if te and th are in phase, right? So that means they both have the same sign. So let's say it's both positive. Well, if they're both positive signs, then it's easy to show after some thought that when k is zero, you have the flat out sum, that's going to be the biggest magnitude. It's, that's gonna be the biggest. If you go to k equal pi, then this is going to turn into a negative sign and it's gonna be te minus th. But if they had the same sign, they're gonna really subtract from each other. And if they were equal and opposite, you would get zero. So you see a um, increase in coupling that fans out from k equal zero to the edges. And what that does, if you look at these uh, these non these these uh, diabatic states before you enact the coupling, you have these flat states, right? You just have uh, K uh, uh, Frankel exciton or CT excitons in Frankel. We don't have Coulomb now, right? So they're flat. Then you enact the coupling; it's like blowing up a balloon, right? You see in the middle you have the biggest interaction, so you very quickly trace out or create a smile. Remember, I told you to focus on the smiles. That's J, right? And you can show uh, from that horrific Hamiltonian that the, uh, the curvature or the band shape is dictated beautifully by this JCT, which we showed was minus two TETH divided by the uh, difference. Now let's go to the case where T and TH are out of phase so that the product is zero, is less than zero. So TE is positive, TH is negative. And by the, exactly the same reasoning, I think you can now appreciate that when K is pi, of course, that's going to change into a negative sign. So it would be TE minus TH, but if they're opposite signs, that becomes a bigger number, right, a, a, an adding. And so 
the uh, biggest influences are on the edges. And then the smallest influence is at k equals zero. So when you enact the couplings, poof, right? Um, you see that it blows up along the edges, but not along the middle. And so you get the opposite curvature in the end for a uh, CT charge transfer H aggregate. So you get a frown, right? Frown on the bottom. Now you might say, oh, I have a smile up top here and a frown here. Um, you have to also know that most of the oscillator, the oscillator strength is entirely confined to the Frankel-like states. The CT states ideally have very, very small transition um, dipole moments on their own. So to go to ground state to a charge separated state is very, very weak compared to a Frankel state. So the lower band in this case is the one that wins the day when it comes to oscillator strength. So when it comes to absorption, it's almost entirely dominated by this lower band in this perturbative limit when this separation is large. So the idea then is I can get H and J aggregates with charge transfer alone. How do I know that? Well, I take that horrible Hamiltonian, I calculate all the eigenfunctions and the eigenvalues, and then I put together the absorption spectra. And here's the result. If I have a molecule with lambda squared equal one, you can't, maybe this is not so great, but you can see the two equal intensities here. Then I enact this charge transfer and it, it becomes a J aggregate. You see how the ratio goes up, right? And then you see how the emission is dominated by zero, zero. Um, if you create an adiphase um, TETH situation, which gives you the H aggregate, you see the opposite behavior. You see a decrease in this A1, A2 ratio, okay? And so they behave exactly like the Coulomb coupled aggregates that I focused on yesterday. So we can get entirely different class of aggregates, J and H aggregates, just based on uh, charge transfer. You don't need Coulomb coupling. So I'm sorry, Kasha, but uh, don't, you know, uh, don't take it personal, okay? So now let's, um, let's look closely. You might still say, um, well, you know, T, E, and T, H, you know, uh, you're, you're saying that they can possibly be both uh, sometimes in phase and sometimes out of phase, but how do you even know that? Um, well, it turns out that both of those integrals are very, very sensitive to molecular slippage. So I'm gonna envision a dimer, in this case of perylenes, where I'm gonna slide, let's say the top perylene over the bottom in either the bottom perylene, either along the long axis or along the short axis. And I'm gonna do that first for the homos so that I'll get a, a the TH integral. So I'm gonna take the uh, two uh, highest occupied molecular orbitals and I'm gonna perform this uh, operation where I just calculate the um, whole integral for each of these positions as they slide along either this long axis or the short axis. And now you can see the, the these orbitals are filled with no, nodes, right? I mean, these are orbitals, right? And so when I put them together, in this dimer, the, no, the uh, wave functions are of course gonna overlap. And if a positive node overlaps with a positive node, that's a bonding-like situation, so that's good. If a positive overlaps a negative, that's anti-bonding. So you're gonna get some kind of um, oscillation in these, in these electron and hole integrals as you slide. In this case, the hole integral as you slide. And here's the uh, contour plot of showing exactly that. So when you start, zero, zero means they're totally eclipsed. So this one's right on top of that one. You can see in that case, we have this, uh, uh, a red, which means a negative sign for the hole. And then as we slide it, you can see how very quickly red becomes blue. So it changes sign, then it goes back to red, then it goes back to blue. So there's a lot of oscillation in this whole transfer interval, right? And if you, all, if you slide it transversely, you see an oscillation as well. Well, okay, that's good, but what about the electronic transfer integral? So we do the same thing with now the LUMOs and you get another mapping, okay? And so this is how the electronic state changes as you, as you slide. Um, you have oscillations here. You don't have oscillations here. You can see that you have this, these nodes which don't change sign along the long axis. So that's the reason why, why the electronic hole uh, transfer integral doesn't change sign. But as we just learned, it's the product which determines J and H behavior. So if I take these two maps and I kind of like multiply them, I get a map like this. And this is a map for negative TETH. So what that means is if it's blue, that means 
it's H-like. Remember, if T and TH are out of phase so that the product is negative, minus the negative is positive, so that would be blue. Blue is H, red is J. So based on these two maps and this expression for JCT, I see a very complex behavior in J and H type behaviors as I slide either along longitudinal or the transverse axis. Just for comparison, what does the Coulomb coupling do? Coulomb coupling is boring. It's hardly doing anything. You gotta go all the way out to almost six angstroms before you can turn an H aggregate into a J aggregate by this head to tail type standard Kasha thing, right? So Kasha said that if you if they're side by side, which would be the eclipsed, right? You have big blue, big positive, but look how if you now uh, uh, translate it along the long axis, again, you've got to go almost a half a molecular width, uh, length away before you can infect the change. Whereas the HJ change here is on the order of a uh, single bond. So within angstroms, within a sub angstrom, you can change from an H to a, from a substantial H to a substantial J. Very, Frank. very sensitive. Frank, uh, just a pause because this is just fascinating. Uh, it's very complex, very rich uh, in terms of the, just the CT being used to define the H and J and the distance, the separation that you're, the slippage. Um, uh, this makes it very hard to interpret the spectral changes, right? Because interpret back to the molecular packing, isn't it? Well, it's it's a genesis of what, um, I'll, if I may, I could tell you a funny story based on your question. So this, it, not many people know this term. It's called crystallochromy, crystallochromy, crystallochromy. Um, it basically is um, a reflection of the extreme sensitivity to orientation and these things. So these paraline molecules, despite having almost, you can put all kinds of N groups on paralines and they pretty much have the same solution spectrum. But when you pack them in a crystal, you get all the colors of the rainbow. Why is that? Because little tiny changes in packing result, like you see here, in big changes in these overlap integrals. And that is responsible for the, home, for the optical gap, as you'll see. Okay. So um, yeah, it's, uh, and this was, actually discovered by none other than um, Hoffman, right? The Nobel Hoffman. And the funny story goes that uh, I wrote a paper and uh, God, it was, um, oh my God, I can't remember the date, but it was the first paper on this subject. And it was the competition between H and J and uh, between long and short range. And I got an email from Hoffman. I was, oh my God, I got an email. From, and I, I didn't look at it the whole day. I was so excited about it. <laughs> Um, anyway, I finally looked at it and, you know, I was envisioning all these, oh, maybe he's going to invite me to Cornell or whatever. But in the end, it was like, uh, dear Dr. Spano, uh, I read your paper with interest. Good start. However, ugh, I hate the howevers. <laughs> it wasn't an unfortunately. But anyway, uh, however, you probably have not seen my paper and you went out to show me this paper that he, the beautiful paper that he written on crystal, crystal acrimony in these systems. So um, it was it was wonderful because um, the paper did nothing about excitons, but it showed everything about these electron hole integrals and this oscillation. This is all comes from Hoffman. Um, all I did was to take it in and relate it to excitons, and then of course I compete it or compare it with cool. So anyway, okay. let's do that. Let's now. Let's sorry, see, sorry. Let's sorry. I'll, I'll just stop you for a second. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have accumulated while you were giving the last few slides. I'll just okay. like to take up because there are some student questions. Sure. Uh, uh, so there is Alfie Benny uh, who says, what happens if the transition have multiple orbitals involved other than just the homo? Ah, okay. Will, Good question. will the whole and electron transfer? Yes, there are different classes of my, you know, you, we can't always assume when you do a uh, configuration interaction or any kind of quantum chemical workup on the S0 to S1 transition, um, in these systems, you can basically, you can rely on the fact that the pi pi star transition is a homo lumo transition, but you're right. It could be, uh, you know, a situation where it's, uh, you know, 70% homo lumo, but it also has a contribution of homo lumo plus one or homo minus one lumo. Yes, that's, that's has to be considered. And as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's open. I have not, um, looked at those situations, but you have to, when I wrote the chem review paper, I was very sensitive about that. And actually a, a paper by um, Joseph uh, Mickle, the singlet fission guy, he 
he's got a beautiful review paper where he classifies molecules based on this very concept. Yes. Um, he calls class one the standard homo lumo, right? But there are other situations beside that. And if that was the case, then you would have to include those nodal patterns for those nodes. It could get complicated. Luckily for this huge range of perilenes, and there's thousands of these derivatives which have been studied over the years, um, they're pi pi star and many other uh, conjugated systems are pi pi star. So, so, he yeah, so he was asking if NTOs will help, natural transition orbitals will help and define new- I suppose they can. Um, again, this is, this is open. So if you have an idea to uh, look at what happens when you take a kind of this, this is the simple case and you can expand it. Yes, be okay. my guest. And, 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 and there is a question by Krishna Priya who asks that can the energetically inaccessible CT Mediate super exchange. If yes, how's the energy difference accounted for? Uh, I think that how's the energy difference? Which energy difference? So I guess the CT uh, state versus the, the the. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's not yet in this. Okay, that's a really good question, and and uh, I I kind of wanted to keep the talk simple, like in a tutorial method where or uh, format where um, it's it best to understand this if the CT the diabetic uh, S or exciton and CT states, those two flat bands that um, we looked at earlier are well separated in energy. And then I could use super exchange and perturbation theory. I have slides, which I didn't include here, but I don't know if you can see my hands. Can you see yes. my hands? Yes. So right now we have a large energy difference so I can use perturbation theory and it gives me a super exchange integral. But I could have very you know resonant states here where the CT and the uh, Frankel are close, and then they're going to split, right? And you're going to get two bands. Yeah. And so yeah. instead of having oscillator strengths focused in the lower band, when you have this large separation, I have a very small separation, it's going to throw oscillator strength in both directions, I'm going to get double bands. And that's exactly what you see in these perylene molecules that I showed you earlier. And I didn't want to, <laughs> that's another, uh, it's a, again, you guys are just, Awesome. Sure, sure. And, and uh, Jayshree, Jayshree, do you want to ask your question quickly? Um, no, I think it's mostly answered because the okay. homo lomo uh, definitions in the T expressions uh, is again going back to your assumption of just the pair of orbitals involved. And, yes. you know, I, I wanted Sorry. to question the two wells representing as S0 and S1, whereas you're using homo lomo orbitals for calculating the integrals. So strictly speaking, if you wanted to do charge transfer integral, it should be between S0 of monomer one with S1 of monomer two sort of thing. Um, well, I mean, you, you, yeah, well, okay. It's, it's what you consider S0 and, or S1, of course, as I said, could be a, a, a mixture of orbitals. But again, we're, we're focusing just on the HOMO for the, T, for the TH and just on the LUMO for TE. Right. And um, yeah, I mean, you guys are, are are figuring out all the different ways to expand this into, and, and that's wonderful uh, because this is just the start. You know, I mean, is, this is the easiest of, sure. of the sure. various. Yeah. So, um, okay, can I, can yes. I go? Yeah. Okay, so now with, uh, with this, this concept in hand, of course, it's perturbation theory, super exchange. We, knew, we, know, we know now you can generalize it for resonance behavior, uh, but let's look now at the, the heart of the problem. Um, go back to our pi stacks, realize that now we have two sources of coupling. Uh, we have good old fashioned Coulomb coupling. And if you do quantum chemistry, you can, you can calculate, for example, atomic charges when you go S naught to S1, again, homo homo, right? Um, and those atomic charges can be used to, to calculate the Coulomb coupling. Here is a point dipole, point dipole, just for the simplistic, but you can make it much more, you can make it much more accurate by using uh, atomic charges and just doing the charge-charge uh, interaction. Um, it's a one over R cube for, for the long range or one over R to some power if you, if you uh, do it more accurately. But uh, again, the super exchange is very short range. Since it depends on over, uh, orbital overlap, obviously it's gonna depend very, very strongly on the distance between the orbitals. And that's usually an exponential, right? Kind of. Uh, dependence. So it very quickly goes away as you pull the molecules away from each other. And that's why it really is uh, manifest in these pi stacks when you have very close uh, contact between neighbors. And so we summarize here, we say in pi stack, long range coupling 
Now it is dominated um, by H. You saw that that picture of the vast blue. <laughs> when you're looking at blue and red, I'm feeling good, right? Because the blue is dominating the red. I'm thinking about what's going on in the country right now, right? We got blue dominating the red. But anyway, that means that most pi stacks are going to give you an H aggregate with respect to coulombic coupling because you really got to shift it really, really long along, along uh, between side by side to get the head to tail, which would give you a J. Um, however, as you, I showed you, the short range coupling is, uh, is much more colorful. There's, there's um, J to H transitions, which happen on much smaller space scales on the order of bond lengths because it involves those orbitals, right? Um, and they change sign when you go from one carbon to the next, it's, it's on the order of an angstrom. So you can get these uh, uh, H or J um, type of interaction uh, behaviors from CT interactions. So the interesting thing is, is there evidence for constructive or destructive interference between these two very different types of interactions? And you can, you can envision HJ, which is really what nature has so far thrown at us. Um, and I'll show you that example in TAT where they're destructively interfering, which is no reason to discount or, or to not uh, admit constructive interference in terms of an HH or a JJ, right? I mean, why not? And so um, it's just that I haven't seen any in, in uh, naturally yet, but maybe we can make them uh, if the properties are desirable for some kind of function. So, uh, but what I'm more interested in now is just how can we tell with vibronic signatures what we have? Okay, so I wanna show you a little bit about this interference effect in the simple case of uh, a linear array pi stack of an HJ. So in HJ, we have our TE and TH and we have our Coulomb. If it's H Coulomb, then that means it's side by side and Kasha would say, oh, Coulomb is, uh, J Coulomb is greater than zero. It's an H aggregate, end of story. However, not so fast because TE, TH happens to be greater than zero, which by the expression for super exchange means we have a J-like influence. So, what is the result of this, this little battle? So we start with a, a, a diagram similar to what I showed earlier when they were both flat. Now I'm showing you the Kasha influence only. So I'm going to incorporate the columbic coupling amongst the uh, Frankel type excitons. Of course, the CT I'm not coupling yet, so it's flat. Um, this is a function of K. And so here I have a frown, right? And we know that's H. And now what happens when I enact the coupling that I showed earlier? Now, again, when TE and TH are in phase, here I have them equal, the dominant coupling is between K equals zero, right? And it's zero between the edges, K equal pi. So now we, we blow up the balloon. Um, and so we, we start slow and we keep adding, you know, we turning on these uh, TE and THs. Um, and what do we get? Well, you can, you can imagine that this positive curve, this negative curvature that you see, this frown will start to become less frownier, right? And eventually it'll go through a flat situation, which I call a null point where the both uh, influences are balanced out. The negative J from the CT integral is balanced by the positive J from the H coupling, the magnitudes are. So it's perfectly destructive interference. And then as you continue to increase your T and TH, you can turn that Kasha frown into a smile, okay? And you can get a nice CT dominate J aggregate, okay? So this is kind of a pictorial of how one would appreciate the interference as a function of increasing T and TH in phase T and TH in an HJ aggregate, okay? And I focus on HJ because that's, there are examples in nature of this that I'll show you. So let's, so, so we did now this big numerical calculation of the spectral properties. And again, we start with a lambda squared equal one for the monomer spectrum. So you see equal intensities. And then if this is the Kasha aggregate, we haven't yet turned on um, the uh, charge transfer, you see a diminished zero, zero and zero, one. Okay, so that's Kasha. But now as I continue to increase the charge transfer integrals, I go through a null point and a null point is such in this approximate approximation with perturbation theory right, with, with well-separated levels, I will get a spectrum which has equal intensities for the first two peaks. In other words, it's gonna look just like the monomer. And that's the point of the null aggregate, right? I mean, if the, if the electronic couplings cancel, 
it should look like an isolated molecule, right? Even though they're strong couplings, but they're in different directions, right? Different signs. And as I continue to increase TE and TH, wow, now I get my H, my J dominated HJ aggregate, okay? So I could come up with a, um, a system of, uh, or I did in subsequent papers, where if the balance is towards J, I can call this a little h, a big J aggregate, you see? And if the balance is toward the H side, I would just make that a, a uppercase H and a lowercase J, all right? And so that's, the, that's how you would appreciate the interference here. But of course, can we see that? And I'm showing some experiments now, and this is, um, was done by uh, Vertner's lab, which is, you guys probably know, it's, it's a, one of the world renowned groups in, in uh, organic photophysics. And he's taken two paralines like we had with a spacer molecule. The spacers are different. And when you put different spacers on, uh, and different solvents, and somehow uh, they were able to get these two different conformations. Now, this is a summary of a, it's a vast amount of spectral characterization, structural characterizations, quantum chemistry, you know, lots, but they basically um, uh, suggest or basically have these two different um, pi stack dimers. Uh, one is 3.5, one is 3.3. Um, and they look at the spectra and you see here, you get two types of behaviors. Um, you have a H, very clear H aggregate here. These are the solution spectra. Just look at the absorption. You can see that the zero, zero, this is in wavelength, right? So you, it's one of the crazy things about anybody who does you know, photophysics or experiment or theory, when you switch between wavelength and energy, you gotta, it's like throwing your brain, in, you know, right to left, left to right. But anyway, uh, you see a inversion of the ratio. Here it's dominated by the zero, zero. Now it's, it's, uh, it's flipped. So um, it's really an H aggregate. So, but you, you know, not a surprise because they're very closely coupled. Um, this one doesn't really change. The ratio is very much similar and yet, the coupling, the distance is even smaller. So what is going on? And what they did is they calculated the Coulombic and the CT couplings. And they found out that yes, in the first case, it is dominated by the positive H-like Coulomb coupling, very small uh, contribution from JCT because of this details of the arrangements, which you really can't see how these two are arranged next to each other. But again, small little changes, big changes in JCT. Because when you go to this one, despite the fact that it's closer, the, the uh, behavior is null. Because now the JCT, for some reason, it's very sensitive, again, to that uh, orientation, is now increased by over an order of magnitude. And it basically is interfering very effectively with the Coulombic to give you this null type behavior. So that's what they concluded. This, so it's very interesting when you look at absorption spectra. For null aggregates, um, the ratio rule is 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 kind of uh, circumvented, right? Because it, it looks like, well, it actually works, but it doesn't. Um, what I mean by that is that just because the ratio is not changing, you would think, oh, it's not, it's not, you know, packing in any way. But it is, and it is strongly coupled. But it's coupled in a in a way that is a is a nice balance. So that's a a, a null aggregate, and I just couldn't resist showing uh, this. This is uh, Mahash, who's probably looking now and saying, ah. But this is just beautiful work on a different type of null aggregate, which I, like I said, I had to say something about. And this is a um, bisaryl penicene crystal where you have these dimers, these cross dimers. And if you cross them at near 90 degrees, the columbic coupling goes to zero and the uh, C, C integral, CT integrals also go to zero. So it's a different type of null aggregate where instead of relying on a destructive interference between two large magnitude effects, you know, Coulomb and, and CT, now you're getting a null because both of them happen to be very small because of the, uh, this uh, near orthogonal arrangement. And you can see nicely when you go from solution to crystal, there's very little change. So these null aggregates are very, very interesting, kind of uh, very curious creatures because you know how easily they could go unnoticed, right? So let's go back now to the finale, which is crystalline TAT. And again, I showed this earlier, nice pie stacks, structural characterization. We know exactly from X-ray how these are oriented. So we can, you know, confidently calculate these T and TH integrals. Here is the uh, single molecule in solution. I forget what solvent. And here is the um, uh, nanopillar spectrum. Okay, big changes. But when you look at it, you'll see, okay, there's a blue shift 
of the main peak. So, okay, that's an H aggregate, but it's also a significant redshift of the origin, right? So you might say, well, that's, that's more of a J influence. And if you use this uh, ratio formula, you'd say, well, this ratio, it's not, you know, it's roughly one here and roughly one in the crystal. So it's not really changing. So what's going on? And you might see from this kind of uh, presentation that there's H and J influences that are fairly well balanced, but not null, obviously. But but there is a uh, nice uh, destructive in interference, which would suggest H, J. So what do we do? We got to calculate it. And so based on that giant Hamiltonian I showed earlier, um, we have to parametrize it. So we have to calculate the Coulomb couplings and we used transition atomic charges, very accurate. And we screened it with a reasonable value of three. And as, we, as I've been saying, it's almost always the case with these pi stacks that the Coulomb is H-like. Okay, so uh, we did that. We also calculated T and TH um, and they're in phase, luckily, because that would suggest J-like behavior. So now we have H and J, so we're in a good, good way. Um, and we um, also introduced, well, we knew these vibrational parameters. Um, anyway, there is the comparison. So we were very gratified to see. It was a lot of work, but we got a very uh, satisfying agreement with experiment. And these, again, the experiments of Mike Barnes at UMass. And so with a nice uh, simulation in hand, now we could break it down. This is something you can't do so easily experimentally, but what if we now look at this, the structure of this spectrum and see what happens if we expose Jekyll and Hyde, okay? How do we expose Hyde? Well, you set, it's very easy to go back into your program and set all the short range couplings to zero. Now it's all Coulomb coupling. There is no CT influence. There is no Jekyll influence. You basically took out Jekyll exposing Hyde. And of course, Hyde is all hunched over. And you see from the dotted spectrum is the experimental or the really good simulation. They're very close. And you can see now how the ratio dramatically drops between the zero, zero and zero. Now it's roughly one half, whereas before it was one. That is a signature of H dominance, right? Which comes over from our uh, vibronic analysis from yesterday, right? So it, it still transcends into this more complex Hamiltonian. So we see this Hyde behavior. Now, how do we expose Jekyll? We shut off the long range couplings. And what happens is now the ratio becomes much bigger, right? And again, this big ratio is related to his Dr. I mean, yeah, Dr. Jekyll's posture, right? He's nice erect here, and you can see this nice zero zero, whereas of course Hyde is hunched over, and you can see this attenuation, right? So exposing Jekyll, and we can see that that when we when we do that experiment in quotes, um, we can now uh, very readily see these these counter influences in this HJ aggregate. And it, that question earlier about is this non-resonant resonant? This is a complete calculation. This is not assuming uh, you know, perturbation theory or anything. So now um, we can see also this, this uh, competition in the exciton bandwidths. And so this is the frown. I told you to think of this as a Dr. Hyde or Mr. Hyde, right? Because it's H-like. And this is what happens when we shut off Jekyll. We shut off the CT interactions. And you, expectedly, you get an H-like frown. And if you do the opposite, like before, and you shut off long range to expose Jekyll, you get a big smile. And now you say, okay, does a smile, you know, uh, interact? Does it get rid of the frown? Uh, and it doesn't quite get rid of the. If you put all couplings, you get this mustache-shaped uh, band dispersion, um, where um, it it doesn't quite go to zero, but the bandwidth is much smaller than the individual bandwidths, right? Maybe a factor of three or so. So you reduce the overall bandwidth. Um, you haven't canceled it out exactly, but you've reduced it through this HJ interaction. And you might say, well, if you reduced it, I don't want to do that. I want to make it bigger. So is there a way to get an HH? And um, actually, I'm going to skip this. This is not really that interesting. Um, yeah, so this is the contour map. It's a little bit more primitive than the one I showed you earlier, but it's it's from a uh, paper uh, published. Uh, oh, geez, oh, I don't even have the date so long ago now, it was like 2015 or so. But anyway, this is for TAT, right? And I just wanted to show you the X-ray structure puts us right in this green dot, which is in the red zone, which is J, right? 
Um, if you look at where it puts us, of course, in the uh, with respect to Coulomb coupling, again, not surprisingly, we're in the blue zone, right? And so we have an H in H J aggregate, right? But the other thing that's very interesting about these plots is it only takes, you know, maybe 0.7 angstroms or so, either longitudinally or transversely, to go from red to blue. You can call this a flip. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm thinking too much about the election. All right, but anyway, we can flip it <laughs> and go from a Republican to a Democrat. Okay, you see what I'm saying? Um, it doesn't take much to make this H, and of course this will always stay H, even if I move along those directions I just alluded to, um, that'll remain H, but this will flip. And if that flips, what happens? So here's the original HJ that we saw earlier. That's nature's orient, you know, configuration, the green dot. Now we can experiment, we can theoretically flip it and make it an HH. And we can do it just by changing the sign of one of those integrals, right? You know, here it's TH. And you can see then it becomes HH and the spectral signature is profound, right? We have this huge drop in the ratio where it was almost one here. Now it's about a third. And so uh, a, a clue as to uh, what's happening again is the ratio. So it's, it really works. And again, this is an exact numerical, it's not um, related to perturbation theory. So that's, that's interesting. We, could, we can convert it to H, uh, HH from HJ, but what does it mean with respect to the most important property, which most uh, optical engineers are interested in, is energy transfer. So we did the experiment, again in quotes, a second time, but this time we solved, and this is real simple, we just took Schrodinger's equation. There is no uh, mixing system in bath or anything. This is just a simple demonstration of what happens to energy transfer when you flip from HJ, where you have destructive interference, to HH, where you have constructive interference, right? And so what we did is we excited the first molecule in a stack of 10. And that's why you see here, the bar is the level of excitation. And then we let the Schrodinger equation go and we see what happens to the excitation. And so, oops, uh, well, that's what happened. Oh, oh you're not going to see it. No, no, no. Um, just click it on the, there's a-, a There it is. Yeah, that's right. Ah, oh, look at that. It's beautiful, right? What you see is it's pinned almost entirely on the, it doesn't really get very far in HJ because it's destructive, right? Whereas in HH, the thing is, the excitation basically is flying down, up and down. Of course, this is all coherent motion. It's totally wave-like Schrodinger. However, it does uh, demonstrate the essential point that interference in these interactions will affect exciton motion. And that's the important part for future studies and for applications, right? So you can take this and we haven't done it. Um, you can take this and make a red field or any of the master equation approaches where you can include uh, couplings with the environment and all that and see what happens. But I think I would bet that it would still be uh, beneficial to have an HH versus an HJ. The other thing that's neat is you don't have to go very far in this change in orientation. And so somebody asked yesterday about pressure. Might you be able to put a shearing pressure or some kind of pressure to convert? Or might you do an experiment where you have an oscillating pressure and some kind of op amp to detect signal and to try to figure out if you can influence an HJ to an HH transition. So these are the things that, that excite me and um, hopefully you're excited too. And then um, you can start really, you know, uh, dreaming here and well, here's your HJ that you saw earlier, but what about a JH where now the uh, Coulomb is J and the, and the uh, CT is, a, is H. And so it doesn't look too different, right? There's some inversions, but then the more important ones are HH and JJ. And of course, those have the constructive interference and the increase in bandwidth, which is important. You can basically say that the bigger the bandwidth, the faster the exciton. You can have HH and JJ. You might say this is a good solar absorber because it's an H aggregate. So you don't have radiative um, energy trend. You know, you're not gonna radiate your energy away. Um, uh, when you create the exciton, it's gotta find the the interface and the charge separate. You don't want it radiating before it finds the interface. And so that might be an HH. The JJ on the other hand might be a good OLED because you want the big bandwidth so that you can move the charges quickly. 
uh, but you want it to radiate too, right? So that would be, this is just speculation, right? I mean, this is just kind of uh, an indicator of what, what one might be able to do. So that, that's kind of what I wanted to show today. There are applications that we've made uh, to these perylene aggregates, which I haven't uh, talked about because it would, it would take too much time, but you could see, uh, for example, in this study, oh, I had the, uh, oh, I have it over here. Um, uh, but basically the summary is that the, the interference is important, right? Long and short range can dramatically affect the properties. Um, I didn't really talk about this. Uh, these two parts, these uh, parts, these two um, molecules, these N-phenyl PDIs, but this, uh, I have the reference on the next page. Um, but if you're interested, you can read this, this chem C, it just came out last year, where look at these two, um, they're different pi stacks, as I showed in a very early talk, um, but they have profound differences on where you are with respect to the null point. Are you on the J side or the H, like a seesaw? Um, and so that's the, the idea, right? So maybe we can do some uh, engineering with some of these concepts. That would be uh, the uh, commercial goal, of course. Um, so let me just very quick, well, I already summarized, right? You can see how I was uh, struggling to prepare this talk. Now I have two summaries, but anyway, it's basically saying, so here's what I was looking for. This is the uh, Olson, uh, April Olson is a student in my group, and this is the paper that discusses the interaction, these PDIs and the, uh, the seesaw behavior on the null point. Um, so, so that's the ideas uh, uh, listed out. Um, and of course you can't, and you, know, you can't do anything without lots of help. Um, there's Hodge again, he, again, he, he's an amazing student and Nick Heston, uh, they did a lot, most of the work I showed you almost all, and Rule Templer, he just started at, as I said yesterday, he's an assistant professor at Northwestern now, um, and April and David Bialis uh, and, and so on, all these people, very, very instrumental and all these experimental collaborators. And I wanna have just one more slide. This is a shout out for a fantastic student of mine uh, Raja Ghosh, who, um, if you're worried, if you're interested in extending everything that I've been talking about, multi-particles and so on, to actual polarons, and so not neutrals that we've been looking at, but actual charges, uh, we just had this paper, uh, ACR, came out. And so Raja Ghosh is currently a postdoc at San Diego doing water modeling, but he's still uh, very much, uh, you know, helpful in, in, uh, in calculating some of these interesting properties of doped P3HT and other systems. So polarons is another frontier is what I'm saying. Yes. Uh, but it's also amenable to the same techniques. The same multi-particle uh, uh, expansion applies to a hole. It's just a cation. I just showed you that cations and anions existing, you know, coexisting in the, uh, and, and interacting with Frankel is already uh, accounted for with multi-particles. So, we also have that opportunity. So um, that's about all I want to say. If um, anyone else uh, wants to ask a question. Yes. yes, thank you. Thank you, Frank. This was fantastic. Um, uh, just a clap all across. Um, I, I think uh, one of the things that uh, polar on dynamics is certainly the next frontier after excitons. And um, there's certainly a lot of interest in our lab and Satish's lab. and uh, many other places, and we, we're finally seeing some vibrational data on the polar on dynamics also. Uh, we've, ah, there's something very interesting we'll discuss later. But there are lots of questions, uh, lots of excitement in the students, and I will have to take one by one. But there are two uh, principally quick questions, one from Pavitra, um, who is a faculty at TIFR Hyderabad, and another uh, Vivek Tiwari, who is a faculty, a uh, young faculty at Indian Institute of Science. So I'll take those first and then come back to the more longer ones. Pavitra? Uh, sure. Yeah, thanks, Jaydi. Uh, thank Frank. It's a nice talk. I enjoyed it. So I just have a query. Actually, it's not a question. You mentioned that uh, H uh, aggregates are good for solar cells and J for OLEDs, if I got that right. But my understanding of the solar cells that the solar cells are also good OLEDs. They have to be. I mean, there's no other way around. So how do you yeah, that was, yeah, that was a, a kind of a, a you know, um, I was just more making the point that you can, you do have the option to go H, H, and JJ. It's far more complicated exciton transfer. I mean, I just use the competition with radiative decay as a, as the, uh, the, 
determining uh, or as a major uh, influence in whether it would be a good solar cell. But yeah, of course, course bandwidth is, is huge and either HH or JJ can have similar bandwidth, right? So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, that goes back to that, the animation I showed in that um, it's far more, far more, far more complicated than just solving Schroeder equation because you really need to interact with, with the environment, you know, and by that, you know, um, you know, uh, thermal fluctuations, anything that, that tends to de decrease or to destroy your coherence. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. It's, it's, it's a much more, um, it's, it's far more complicated than just looking at the HH versus JJ. Yeah. Yes, uh, may I just add one more, JD? Yes. That's sure, sure, uh, please. Uh, if you look at this radiative uh, luminescence, uh, can you just comment that in which case the radiative efficiency would be higher in case of HH on the J aggregation? I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the which the uh, unit. The radiative luminescence, like let's say the quantum yield in thin films. So what mm -hmm. do you expect to be higher in the H aggregation or in the J aggregation? Because that so, might just put some light. So the, so the quantum yield, it's a, actually, that's a very, a very nuanced question that, you know, uh, and I'm thinking about the papers of uh, Johannes Gierschner, who does wonderful work in this area. But um, the quantum yield is, um, you, is, is lower or doesn't have, to, so, Basically what we can say about an H aggregate is the radiative decay rate is compromised. It's smaller than it is for a single molecule. However, quantum yield, as you well know, is a competitive measure. So despite the fact that you can have a very low radiative decay rate, it may just happen that your non-radiative decay rates are similarly low. And so you can still get a large quantum yield even in an H aggregate. And there's a, as I said, Gierschner has um, wrote a wonderful paper about this. A lot of people, make the erroneous statement that say H aggregates have low quantum yields. That's not, it, that's not uh, true in all cases because the only, the thing that the accurate statement should have been in H aggregates, there is a uh, decrease or a subradiative uh, sub type behavior. In other words, the uh, radiative decay rate is less than the molecule, but it doesn't say anything about the quantum yield unless you then additionally add in non-radiative um, effects and oh, then you can say whether they're big or small compared to that, yeah. right? Yeah. And J yeah. aggregates yeah. You know, have the super radiant radiator. So yeah, that's a subtle nuance. It's a very, very, um, you know, as I say, go to the, the Gierschner paper really does a beautiful job in highlighting. And what you, you can have a, a radiant H aggregate, right? I mean, it's possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We make, we make. Yeah. Um, hi, Professor Spano. This is Vivek again. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, so I just had a quick question, which kind of relates to one of the questions by the students in the chat box. The question was about, uh, you know, how different is a vibration on a neutral molecule versus, let's say, a cation or an anion? Mm -hmm. and, and my question was, uh, actually, uh, how much do you think the, uh, you know, the charge transfer coupling depend on the sign of the frank condon factor or sign of the frank condon displacement? You know, okay. Whether... Again, you guys, excellent. So the idea is uh, fairly straightforward. I mean, you're you're still looking at, let's say it's uh, aromatic quinoidal mode, which we've said. Um, I look at it this way. When you go, when you have an electron in a hole, in other words, uh, S naught S1, we create the entire, you're getting the maximum out of your uh, nuclear displacement. So you're going from, let's say, mostly our, the, uh, let's say if you start aromatic, you're building in your, the most of your quinoidal character in your excited state. If you go to just a hole or just a electron, you're kind of like going halfway. And therefore you're not completely shifting as far as you would be if you had an electron and a hole, in other words, a neutral excitation. So your Huang Ries factors are going to be smaller and the experiment shows this, many experiments. You can do a UPS experiment. You can analyze the vibronics of the uh, of, of the resulting spectra, and you can show that um, the uh, lambda factor, the Huang Ries factor for a hole or electron, is usually, let's say, a quarter to a half as large as the neutral. And there are calculations by Petalins, for example, who does beautiful work. Quantum chemistry does a paper which which shows this 
Okay. But uh, so my, my question was whether, you know, the whether the sign of the Frank on ah, displacement. Okay, so the next part, so let me, I, again, great, yeah. So I don't know if you could see my hands, but basically um, because we're, we're advancing along that common mode, that from aromatic to conoidal. So you're, you're progressing, let's say you're here, the, uh, the charge anion, uh, cation or anion is here as far mm -hmm. as your shift, and then your neutral is here. So the shifts are uniformly in the same sign. However, you could say we're starting here in the ground state. We're gonna go here, we're gonna reverse it for the, new, for the anions and then go back the other way for the, that's what you're talking about, changing the sign. That I have not seen that would give different results. So the relative sign, they could both be positive or both be negative, that's fine. But if one is positive and one is negative, you would get different behavior. And yes, uh, it would change your physics, your photophysics, but I haven't, I don't know how to justify that based on the experiments that I've seen, like in penicene and, and the acenes, a lot, of, a lot of work is done to measure cation and anion on Reese factors and compare it to their neutrals. And, um, you know, there's no evidence of this opposing sign change. I mean, it, it would be hard to justify based on the model of this common aromatic quinoidal mode advancing in a, in a given direction. But it could, I don't know, I, I just haven't um, uh, seen the, there's no experimental motivation. You could do the calculation and I'm sure you'd get some very interesting result. But the more interesting thing is, does it really exist in nature? How do you um, I, I'm sure there's probably some some uh, example of it somewhere, but I think uh, uh, just from a background in two-dimensional spectroscopy, I think there were some uh, initial papers about you know if the sign of the Frank Condon factor becomes different, what are the destructive interference effects and so on. But you know those might not be uh, or those would not be applicable maybe for linear spectra. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's all about just like you see for T E and T H. It's it's all about relative sign, right? So. Um, I agree that um, if you change the sign between uh, lambda plus to the cation and say lambda minus or lambda neutral, you're going to get a, a weird effect. If you keep them all positive or if you keep them all negative, I don't think there's going to be any change. But if you have relative changes of those signs, then there's going to be big impact. Okay, um, I'll, I'll just, uh, thanks Vivek, uh, thanks Pavitra. I just wanted to take few student questions because they have been putting on the chat for some time now. I'll just quickly make uh, uh, the Dipin's question. Uh, Dipin Tomar asked, uh, for CT induced JH aggregates, does the sign of JCT depend on how the transition dipoles are oriented with respect to each other? Um, in other uh, words- I remember, um... The transition dipoles have, oh, maybe your question is deeper than what I, what I initially assumed, but I, you know, I try to, I have not really looked. So you're saying that, um, well, okay. The, the easy answer is that the transition dipoles influence the uh, long range coupling, the dipole dipole and the, um, you know, the uh, electron and hole integrals in, in, in influence the, J, the JCT. So they're independent. Um, I haven't, you know, I'm not, I have not seen any studies or I have not conducted any studies where um, if you look at a homo and a lumo transition, uh, whether there is a relationship between how the transition dipole moments change uh, relative to T and TH. And that might be what you're asking. And yeah, yeah I, I don't think know. Right. Um, to connect back to the structure. He's trying to connect back to the structure. How does one think about it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've so far thought about it relatively, you know, independently for those two uh, entities. Uh, we know that, of course, um, the electron and hull depend on, I mean, they depend on different orbitals. So that's why I'm saying it's not obvious. A transition dipole depends on the homo and lumo of one chromophore, right? Whereas T, E, and T, H depends on neighboring homo. So it involves two molecules and neighboring lumo. So there's no reason to you know, like when I shift one molecule versus the other, I'm not changing the transition dipole at all. It's still the same original homo lumo, but I'm changing the overlap. So I'm dramatically changing T E and T H. So but I guess what I'm saying is I would, I suspect they're fairly independent. Right. Okay. Um, I just wanted to tell Alfie Benny, who actually is in the audience, the student from Mahesh's lab, 
That's the paper you showed, you know, ah. one of the co-authors, uh, the 2020 Jax paper. Um, uh, uh, Krishna Priya has asked, uh, can you correlate the null HJ aggregate and eczema formation? Uh -huh. <laughs> that is a, that's something we're, we're actually thinking about. Um, we would love, we look at this as a gigantic puzzle with lots of lots of missing pieces and uh, vision is one I mean you guys uh, experts there um, and eczemers is the other and so is there a, a similar uh, kind of um, you know relationship if you move you know if you have these ability to reorient the uh, neighboring chromophores uh, you you should influence the eczema emission as well right and so are there um, what is the um, you know, connection between an optimal, you know, how do you optimize eczema emission? Do you have a perfect H-like overlap or is it more H to J? From what I see from like Wazalewski stuff, I think you need to, I think he says the more overlap you get, so the more H-like, the more eczema like uh, emission you get. And then if you move head to tail, it becomes less. I don't know. I think that's extremely simplified um, and I'm not sure that works, but um, we're actually, um, my student, April Olson, whose paper I showed at the very end, uh, she's actually considering that very problem. Okay. So we don't know yet, but it's a it's a very uh, intriguing uh, I, you know, question. Yeah. Okay, Sanjay, Sanjay Patra, he says, how does the intramolecular modes involved in CT states are different from that in the Frankel states or the modes need uh, to be coupled other than the electronic coupling, JCT? So, so what did, the question is essentially, um, when we consider the vibronics uh, with the Frankel states, are they mm -hmm. different from uh, when we consider the CT states? Well, the vibronics, uh, again, we have the same, uh, back to some of the earlier questions, we never change the frequency of the mode, whether it's Frankel or CT. That's a, that's a simplification, but it's rel relatively justified experimentally. Right. So it's 1400 wave numbers in the ground state, roughly and it's 1400 wave numbers for a cation and it's 1400 wave numbers for an anion and that's what we have. Right. Um, and so, yeah, um, the model is, is flexible enough to include changes. Um, the biggest problem with that would be you'd have to numerically evaluate all the overlap integrals because you have different curvature, you know, nuclear uh, surfaces. And so that's not gonna be, you know, it's all doable. But again, you know, I usually don't do anything unless um, there is a good motivation from experiment. That's you because there's so many things you can do theoretically that have no uh, relationship to what's been measured. Now you might say, oh, you can do something and make a great prediction and then someone will measure it. Yes, that, I can see that too. But usually you want to do something that's uh, contributing to some puzzle, some, some you know, experiment that's uh, difficult to explain any other way. Sure. Okay. Um, so now we have just one question, and then I will let Satish ask uh, uh, his 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 points. And um, also, there is one. I think there will be one question from Jayshree. Uh, so I'll just first read the student question. Eben Sebastian, again from Mahesh's lab. How will the situation stand in case of covalently linked dimers instead of non-covalently linked aggregates? Can you comment on that? So in covalently linked dimers. That's the uh, in versus non-covalent. Right. Is that the question? Yeah, non-covalent aggregates. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Okay. So as I said, um, that's a whole other talk. Okay. So if you look at a polymer um, as a covalent, of course, it's a covalently uh, bound repeat units, right? Um, you might, you could use this theory. You can use the uh, T E and T H formalism, and you can calculate. You know, you can calculate the homo and lumo for each repeat mm -hmm. unit, right? And then you can calculate the TEs and THs based on the overlap. And then you can calculate an effective exciton coupling. And then you could see whether it's J or H. And we've done that. And um, you get very similar behaviors. So in other words, if I have a, um, let's say P3HT, a single chain, um, and I compare it to P3H, and I, I do a study where I change the length of the chain, you can see as it gets longer, uh, and you maintain order that it become it, it's J-like. It really is. So um, a single polymer consisting of a 
of a uh, you know a system of covalently bound repeat units is amenable to this uh, this formalism, and it turns out that it's a J aggregate. So that was the genesis actually of my JH uh, you know direction because we found out we actually did it backwards. We started our work with stacks of P3HT and we were ordered only about the intermolecular. So the, along the interchain direction, which was H-like. And then after I thought about it a couple of years later, I thought, well, what if each chain is as, as a covalently bound system of units can be considered as a J aggregate. So now we have a J in one direction and an H in the other. Boy, that's weird. Are we still going to get any? And and I don't show it, but really there's great experiments by John Gray uh, and others to show that you really do get uh, these HJ behaviors represented by these polymers, which is a mixture of covalent and non-covalent. Okay. So you really can get that. Okay. Okay, Jayashree, you have any questions or comments? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah okay. just, just a quick question. Uh, so Professor, given that you're able to produce uh, J and H aggregates using the CT coupling alone, uh, so given a situation and, you know, for, for example, we don't know whether it's perturbative uh, how are we going to uh, distinguish between a J aggregate that's coming from necessarily uh, just the CT or the uh, Coulombic? Because I can see that the signs are probably different, but you could, you know, result in the same uh, spectrum. By that's a very good question. So your sign, you're, you basically want to know, um, if there is, if, let's say it's a pure um, CTJ aggregate, or if it's a even stronger J aggregate, but with some element of H as well in it. In other words, an HJ versus a pure J, um, where you have, in the first case, you know, a Coulomb, you know, long mm -hmm. and short or H versus just short. That's a hard, that's hard to distinguish because our spectral signatures kind of indicate the net result, right? So. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would really require deeper analysis than just saying, oh, the ratio is this, it's got to be, you know. Um, but in some cases, like the null aggregates, um, like the experiment I showed you with the perilines, um, well, actually, that's probably a good example because you did see very little change in the ratio. So that's a, like a, like, eh, what's going on here? Why isn't there a change in the ratio? Why is the absorption spectrum not changing when I aggregate or I dimerize? Something going on. And uh, I guess you could say, you know, it's hard to say. You, you would say, okay, one possibility is that the both the long and the short range couplings, like in the penicine ones I showed, are very small. Okay, but how do you yeah. tell that the difference between that case and then the other case where the H and the J influences are not both practically zero, so you get a null, but are mm -hmm. both quite large but opposing each other. Of course, how do you tell? Because both give you the same ratio. Right. And so the only way to do that then is to go and do quantum chemistry, like what David sure. Elias with Gertner did, and, and actually calculate the JCT. So in that case, the ratio is just the first step. It's actually mm -hmm. piece together what kind of what kind of system you have. So you really got to involve experiment and theory. And yeah, I guess one could back calculate the JC, for instance, from the ratio of the zero 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 one, and maybe you know, double check without the JCT and, you know, the, do that sort of analysis right, as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, okay. A, it's, a, it's a process. It's not, you know, I would yes. love uh, to have a, <laughs> another s signature which would actually pull, pull apart the J and the H and, you know, but um, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a beginning. I mean, there's, I think there's that would have a tremendous impact on the energy transfer yeah. community because they can't distinguish the two in, in some sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like in the one case, exactly in the case where there really is zero for each uh, for long and short range, you're going to get lousy <laughs> transfer, and that's exactly what um, the paper on the cross penicene show in the its localized excitations because mm -hmm. even in the crystal, because uh, individually both those forces JCT and J cool are very small, right? And you see the the same spectral signature for the absorption ratio. Then you go to another case where you have big JCT and big mm -hmm. J cool, but they're opposites. And you still see <laughs> absorption like the same ratio, but now, uh, but, but you actually in that case, you would also see uh, compromised uh, energy transfer, but um, right. it's very right. sensitive though. You can tip it very, when they're large and negative, it's very easy to tip one, one of the other directions. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's um, um, 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jashri. Uh, Satish, uh, you have your points. Yeah. Okay. I think it's now time to thank Frank. Uh, uh, it was on behalf of both the institute. Frank, let me thank you for accepting our invitation and spending so much time. I, I, mean, I think <laughs> the, you're not only eluded us with the remarkable work what you have done. Uh, it was you also opened up in new questions, a new. Uh, you know, directions for the field where uh, the idea of this webinar is, uh, you know, to open a new questions in these kind of a forefront research areas. I think this has been remarkable and it is fascinating. It was very, very rich in information, I would say. And it also shows how much you love the subject because each question, you know, you have spent so much time to address questions of a uh, student tackle. Tough ones. <laughs> <laughs> no, tough. So I think uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think bye You know that's what I can say. You know. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Satish. Yeah. So so I just wanted to uh, thank two individuals. Uh, really, um, without whom this is the YouTube wouldn't have happened. First is uh, B Satyanarayana from TIFR who helped me with the streaming, and the second person is an ISC faculty whom I ran to. Uh, during a stressful time when the thing was not working. And that is Nagafani Etkuri, who actually helped me, Professor Nagafani Etkuri. Thank you very much, Fani, for helping me uh, through that uh, period. And also, uh, I would like to ask everybody in the entire, uh, if there are more questions, uh, I know there are lots of questions not taken yesterday. Please put them in the YouTube comments box and um, Professor Spano will check. Uh, we, we are going to send the links. We are going to send the links. He will check and maybe he can post a short answer uh, right there. Um, okay. um, and yeah. if, if, if that's okay with you, Frank, right? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so thank you very much, Frank, for doing this. This was exceptional start to our webinar series and Satish and I are over the top right now. Uh, because you were the right person to do this and absolutely <laughs> pedagogical, absolutely uh, wow. tutorial style. So thank you. Thank and you. Thank you guys as well. It was a, it was a great honor and privilege and, and, you know, to come and give a, a talk in front of such a wonderful crowd. And as I said earlier, the questions are just remarkable. This is um, probably the best set of questions I've ever had in any, in any talk and, the, and numerous as well, <laughs> but uh, it really, um, it was one of the best, uh, formats I've ever been involved with where we really the exchange of ideas is so plentiful and rich. So thank you very, very much for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will end the webinar now. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Be safe.